Hi guys, I am so excited to be able to be with you today and hopefully every day. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Mrs. Reader at South Elementary uh, chose some readers and I get to be one of the readers to read to you guys and I've chosen a novel to read. I will not read it all at once, uh, but maybe a chapter or two a day and that novel that I have chosen is six points. It's a 5.7 grade level, but that's okay because I'm going to be reading it to you. And I have missed you guys so much, and I can't wait to get back and, and let's all be together. But until then, we're going to hang out with Miss Hammond and read. And all you have to do is just sit around on pillows or on the sofa or on the lounge chair or outside, wherever you are, and listen. Then, when I'm all done, I'll give you the book number, and you may take a test on it. So, can't get much better than that. The <clears throat> book that I've chosen today is one that I just absolutely love. It is Matilda. Matilda is a fiction book. It is a fantasy. It's humorous. It's lighthearted. And I thought, well, during all of this, I would like to read Matilda because it, it's humorous. It makes us laugh. Matilda is written by Rule Dahl. Rule Dahl is a British author. In fact, his name is from a Norwegian descent, but it's Rule Dahl, and it's illustrated by Quentin Blake. Uh, it's a, a longer book, but one that we are going to just do over time. I will be doing shorter stories also that you can go ahead and, and test on, but this one's going to give us six points. So it's going to be great. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the book before I start reading it. And then I have a few vocabulary words that may be unfamiliar that I want to go over with you, okay? Matilda, if you haven't seen it, I, I watched the movie just like last week. It was on TV television. And I watched it. Love it, love it, love it. And I can't get enough of it. It's just, it's a fun, loving book. And she is a little genius. She's not even five years old. Doesn't go to school. She's a genius. The only problem with poor little Matilda is that she has these horrible parents that that her daddy just goes to work and all he thinks about is himself and the mother. All she wants to do is go play bingo every day. The brother goes to school and that leaves poor little Matilda at home by herself. I mean, she's already read everything that she can find in her house. And she is so smart. I mean, this little girl knows like 398 times 87. I mean, she can multiply that and, and, and just tell it to you just like that. She's a genius. But in the end, she finds some ways to trick her parents because she gets really tired of the way that they treat her. I want you to enjoy this light-hearted little book, one that I hope that will become your favorite like it is, Miss Hammond's. Again, Hanging with Miss Hammond is a great way to listen, to do some homeschooling, and to enjoy a great novel. The first chapter has some vocabulary that we may be a little bit unfamiliar with. And one word is a word, I, I like this word, it's basin. Basin is, let's get it to where I can show you. Now, I'm new to this, so, you know, we're going to have to get all the uh, little glitches out, but basin is a sink. Now, I used to hear this word when I go to my grandmother's. My grandmother called the sink a basin. She would say, well, go wash your hands in the basin. So, I actually knew this, but you guys might not uh, have heard this word, and it is used in this book, and it's basin, and it's a sink. So, that's one of the words. Another word that I found that uh, might be unfamiliar is grub. Grub is dirty or gross. So if something is grub or someone is grub, they're dirty and gross. Um, a chrysalis. Now, a chrysalis is something that you might have learned in science class, but it's that hard outer covering of like an insect cocoon or uh, you know, even humans. We can crawl up in our imaginary chrysalis 
and stay there because we don't want to go out or we don't want to see someone or we're just not very, you know, into people that day. So Christmas is the hard outer covering. And we have formless. Gormless is not very smart. So instead of saying not very smart, they say gormless in the book. Hankering. Hankering is a strong desire. I have a hankering to read to you. Even though I have stage fright, and I don't know why, but I do, because I haven't videoed myself reading to you. I've only done it in person. So it's like, here I am doing this, but you know what? I'm going to do it because I love you guys, and I want you to enjoy reading. Okay? So, Matilda by Rule Doll, illustrated by Quentin Blake, a wonderful book. And we're going to start with chapter one. Chapter one, and there's not a whole lot of pictures, and I'm in my dining room doing this. Um, so hopefully, you know, I'd like to have some different settings, but uh, today it's the dining room because it's sort of um, dreary outside. The reader of books, and um, there's 227 pages in this. And the first chapter is the reader of books. Here we go. You sit back, you grab some pillows, or you get on the sofa. Tell your friends. And they don't all have to be from South Elementary. We can be from anywhere. Tell your friends. I will place this on YouTube for you to see. And then you may share it to Facebook. So we'll see how all this goes, but I'm really excited. Okay. So I may get better as time goes on. The reader of books. It's funny thing about mothers and fathers, even when their own child is the most disgusting little blister that you could ever imagine. They still think that he or she is just wonderful. Hmm. Some parents even go further than that, you know. Oh, yes, they become so blinded by adoration that they manage to convince themselves their child is qualities of a genius. Well, there is nothing very wrong with all this. It's the way of the world, you know. And it is only when the parents begin telling us about the brilliance and their own revolting offspring that we start shouting, Bring us a basin, I'm going to throw up. I'm going to be sick. In the basin, I guess that's in the sink. Well, here's a little picture. That's Matilda, some of her family there. School teachers, oh, school teachers, suffer a great deal from having to listen to this sort of twaddle from proud parents. Oh, oh, yes, they do. And uh, they usually get their own back when the time comes to write the end of the term paper reports. If I were a teacher now, huh, I could cook up some real scorchers for the children of doting parents. So, oh, yes, I would. Your son, Maximum, I would ride as a total washout. I hope, I hope that you have a family business that you can push him into when he leaves school because he sure as heck won't get a job anywhere else. I would really say that. Or if I were feeling lyrical that day, I might write, it is a curious truth that grasshoppers have their hairing organs in the sides of their abdomen. Your daughter, Vanessa, judging by what she's learned this year, has no hearing organs at all. I wouldn't say that. I might even develop deeper into natural history and say, the periodical cicada spends six years as a grub underground and no more than six days a free creature of sunlight and air. And your son, Wilbur, has spent six years as a grub in this school, and we are still waiting for him to emerge from his chrysalis. A particularly poisonous little girl might sting me in the saying, Fiona has the same glacial beauty as an iceberg, but unlike the iceberg, she is absolutely nothing below the surface. I think that I might enjoy writing in the term report for the speakers in my class. But that's enough of that because we have to go on. Occasionally, one comes across parents who take the opposite line. 
Well, who shows no intent at all for their children. And these, of course, are far worse than those doting ones. Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood were two such parents. Mm. And they had a son called Michael, Michael, and a daughter called Matilda. And the parents looked upon Matilda in particular as nothing more than a scab. A scab is something that you have to put up with until the time comes when you can pick it off and flick it away. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Warmworth looked forward enormously to the time when they could just pick their little daughter off and flick her away, preferably into the next country, or even further than that. It was bad enough when parents treat ordinary children as though that they were scabs and bunions, but but it becomes somewhat a lot worse when the child in question is extraordinary. Huh. And by that, I mean sensitive and brilliant. Oh, Matilda was both. She was both of these things, but above all, she was brilliant. Oh, my goodness. Matilda was, uh, her mind was so nimble and she was so quick to learn that her ability should have been obvious even to the most half-witted of parents. Mr. and Mrs. Warmwood would both so gormless and so wrapped up in their own silly little lives that they failed to notice anything unusual about their daughter. And to tell you the truth, I doubt they would have noticed had she crawled into the house with a broken leg. Tilda's brother Michael, though, was a perfectly normal boy. But the sister, as I said, was something to make your eyes pop. I mean, by the age of one and a half, her speech was just perfect. And she knew as many words as most grown-ups do. And the parents, instead of applauding her, they would just call her noisy little chatterbox and told her just sharply that no small girl should be seen but not heard. Well, by the time she was three years old, Matilda had taught herself to read by studying newspapers and magazines. And, and, and anything that she could get her hands on that was lying around the house. And that's the age of four years old. She could read fast and well. She naturally began hankering after books. The only book in the whole of this, uh, uh, Hank, the only book in the whole of this enlightened household was something called easy cooking. Easy cooking. And that belonged to her mother. And when she had read this from cover to cover and had learned all the recipes by heart, she decided she wanted something more. Well, then, Daddy, she said, do you think that you could buy me a book? A book? He said, well, what do you want a climbing book for? To read, Daddy. What's wrong with the telly, for heaven's sakes? We've got a lovely television with 12-inch screen, and now you're asking me for a book? Huh, you're getting spoiled, my girl. Nearly every weekend afternoon, uh, Matilda was left alone in the house, and her brother, five years older than her, well, he went to school, and her father went to work, and her mother went out playing bingo eight miles away. Mrs. Warwood was hooked on bingo, and she played it like five afternoons every day. Well, on the afternoon of the day when her father had refused to buy her book, Matilda just set out all by herself to walk to the public library in the village. And when she arrived, she introduced herself to the librarian, Mrs. Phelps. She asked if she might sit a while and read a book. Mrs. Phelps, slightly taken back by the arrival of such a tiny little girl, she accompanied her, by, uh, uh, unaccompanied by a parent or anyone. Nevertheless, she told him that she was very welcome. Where are the children's book, please? Matilda asked. Well, they're over there on the lower shelves. Mrs. Phelps told her, would you like for me to help you find a nice one with lots of pictures in it? Oh, no, thank you, Matilda said. I'm sure that I can manage. And from then on, every afternoon, as soon as her mother left for her bingo, Matilda would toddle down to the library. And the walk took only 10 minutes. And so she uh, uh, was allowed two glorious hours that she could sit and read quietly by herself in a cozy corner devouring book after book. Oh, it was so awesome. 
And when she had read every single children's book in the place, she started wandering around in search of something else. Mrs. Phelps, who had been watching her with fascination for the past week, now got up from her desk and went over to her. Can I help you, Matilda? She asked. Well, <clears throat> I'm wondering what to read next. Matilda said, I finished all the children's books. You mean you've looked at all the pictures? Well, yes, but I read the book as well. Mrs. Phelps looked down at Matilda and from her great height, and Matilda looked right back up at her. I thought uh, some very poor, I thought some were very poor, Matilda said, but others were lovely. Oh, I like the secret garden best of all. Oh, it was full of mystery. The mystery, the room. There she is, Mrs. Phelps, looking down at Matilda. Look at that old straightener. Oh, I'll get this better as we go on. And the room behind the closed door and the mystery of the garden behind the big wall. Mrs. Phelps was stunned. Exactly how old are you, Matilda? She asked. Well, I'm four years old in three months, Matilda said. Mrs. Phelps was more stunned and then, and then ever. And she had the sense not to show it, though. Oh, well, what sort of book would you like to read next? She asked. Matilda said, well, I would like a really good one that grown-ups read. Uh, a famous one, maybe. <laughs> um, I, I don't know any of their names. Mrs. Phelps looked around on the shelves, uh, taking her time, and she didn't quite know what to bring out. Well, how, she asked herself this one, she was a famous grown-up book for a four-year-old girl. Her first thought was to pick a young teenage novel of a romance, the kind that is written for 15-year-olds, but just for some reason she found herself instinctively walking right past that particular ship. Try this, she said at last. It's a very famous and very good, and it's, it's too long for you, darling. Just, just let me know, and I'll find you something else, shorter and a bit easier. Great Expectations, Matilda read by Charles Dickens. Oh, I'd love to try it. Oh, I must be mad. I must be able to tell herself, but to Matilda, she said, of course you may try it. Over the next few afternoons, Mrs. Phelps could hardly take her eyes from the small girl sitting for hour after hour in the big armchair at the far end of the room with the book on her lap. Oh, it was necessary to rest on the lap because it was too heavy for her to hold it up, which meant she had to sit leaning forward in order to read. Oh, and a strange sight it was. Oh, my goodness. Oh, with this little tiny dark-haired person sitting there with her feet nowhere near touching the floor, totally absorbed in this wonderful adventure of Phil and Miss Havensham and her cobwebbed house and all the spells of the magic of Dickens and the uh, Dickens and the great storyteller that had woven everything with his words. Oh, the only moment when the reader was the lifting of the hand and every now and then to turn over a page and Mrs. Phelps always felt sad when the time came for her to cross the floor and say, well, it's ten to five, Matilda. During the first week of Matilda's visits, Mrs. Phelps had said to her, Does your mother walk you to and from here every day? Oh, my mother, she goes to play bingo every afternoon. Matilda said, She doesn't know that I come here. But that's surely not right, Mrs. Phelps said. I think that you'd better ask her. Oh, I'd rather not, Matilda said, as she doesn't encourage reading books, or nor does my father. But what do they expect you to do every afternoon in, in the empty house? Just moved around and watch that tell you. I see. She doesn't really care what I do, Matilda said, a little sadly. Well, Mrs. Phelps was concerned about the child's safety on the walk through the fairly busy village, high street, and the crossing of the road, but she decided not to interfere. Within a week, Matilda had finished Great Expectations, which in the edition uh, contained 411 pages. Oh, I loved it, she said to Mrs. Phelps. Mrs. Has Mr. Dickens written the others? A great number, said the astounded Miss Phelps. Oh, shall I choose you another one? Over the next six months, under Mrs. Phelps' supervision and watchful and compassionate eye, Matilda read the following book. She read Nicholas uh, Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, 
Jane's Eerie by Charlotte Bronte. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Oh, Gone to Earth by Mary Webb. Kim by Robert Kipling. The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells. The Old Man of the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway. The Sound of the Fury by William Faulkner. The Crates and Wrath by John Steinbeck. And the list went on and on. And it was a formidable list that by now that Mrs. Phelps was filled with wonder and excitement. It was probably a good thing that she did not allow herself to be completely carried away by it all. Unless anyone else witnessing this achievement. Oh, they would have been carried away and, and with a small child. They would have been tempted to make a great fuss and shout to the news and all over the village and beyond. She was someone who minded her own business. And she was someone that had long since discovered that it was seldom worth while to interfere with other people's children. Now, Mr. Hemingway said a lot of things that I don't understand, Matilda said to her, especially about men and women. But I loved it all the same. Oh, the way that he tells, tells it, I feel I am right there on the spot watching it all happen. Oh, a fine writer. Will always make you feel that way, Mrs. Phelps said. And don't you worry about, about the little bits that you don't understand. You just sit back and allow the words to wash away and you like music. Oh, I will. I will. Oh, did you know, Mrs. Phelps said, that public libraries like this allow you to borrow books and to take them home? I didn't know that. Matilda said, could I do it? Well, of course, Mrs. Phelps said. When you have chosen the books that you want, bring them to me, and I will make a note, and it's yours for two weeks. And you can even take more than one if you'd like. Oh, from that moment on, Matilda would visit the library, and that put Matilda in her bedroom. That became her little sanctuary where she read. Matilda would visit the library only once a week in order to take out new books and return the old ones. Her small bedroom I was now becoming her reading room. And there she would sit and read most afternoons, often with a mug of hot chocolate. Because Matilda loved hot chocolate. She was not quite enough, uh, old enough to reach things in the kitchen, but she kept a small box outside. And she would get the box and she would bring it into the kitchen and, and she would get the things that she loved, especially hot chocolate. And... Occasionally, she would make other hot drinks, but her favorite was the hot chocolate, of course. And it was pleasant to take a hot drink up to her room and to have it beside her as she sat in her silent room reading in the empty house in the afternoons. And the books transported her into new worlds and introduced her to amazing people who lived exciting lives. And she went on an olden day sailing ship with Joseph Conrad, and she went to Africa with Ernest Hemingway and to India with Rudyard Kipling, and she traveled all over the world while sitting in her little room in an English village. And that's the end of the first chapter, and I hope you enjoyed that. Tomorrow, we're going to read another chapter. It's Mr. Warwood, the Great Car Dealer. And also, we may read two because it's not quite as long as the first one. I hope you've enjoyed it. I love seeing you guys. And goodbye for now. Have a great day. And tell all your friends and join me every afternoon. Thank you.